Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today, we welcome back Top Step Trader. Michael and Bob are both here today to talk about mastering candlestick math. And this webinar is part of our very special four-year anniversary that we've been having all month long with uh, 16 webinars all month. And uh, included in that have been some really fantastic prizes, including this webinar's uh, prizes of four Top Step Trader Combines, four t-shirts, and four hats. So uh, definitely pay close attention to the content covered today so you have a chance to win one of those prizes at the end of the webinar. Uh, some of the bullet points that uh, Michael and Bob want to uh, hit on today include the concept of candlestick math, living bar by bar and tick by tick, a look behind price action, dealing with all the noise, and adhering to the winning setups and keeping your confidence. I also want to remind everybody that the webinar is being recorded and I'll post the recording on YouTube sometime tomorrow. If you're watching it, do me a favor and give us a thumbs up if you like it. I'll also post it on BMT. Uh, Bob and Mike have asked to hold most questions until the end of the presentation, so keep that in mind. Uh, just hang on to your question until the presentation is done and then we'll open it up for Q&A uh, from everybody. Okay, and with that, give me one second, and I'm going to turn things over to Mike and Bob. All right, thanks, uh, Mike. And Mike, I do, I do want to congratulate you on uh, four years. We're going to be hooking up our screen here in a second. Let me know if we got uh, everything okay. Yeah, we've got it, okay. and I uh, can hear you just fine. Thanks, Mike. Okay. And again, Mike, I do want to congratulate you on four years running a top-notch uh, uh, trading forum. Uh, it's an honor to be here again. Uh, I'm with Bob Iacchino. Those that don't know me, I'm uh, uh, Michael Patak. I'm a uh, founder and CEO of Top Step Trader. Uh, we're an up, up and coming uh, uh, scouting agency for traders, and we help develop and discover traders, providing them an opportunity. Uh, I have uh, Bob, who currently serves as our chief market strategist for Top Step Trader and the head of Top Step Traders University the College of Trader Development. It's an outstanding course that he has developed and we have uh, been lucky enough to partner up with him. Uh, Bob, I'm going to let you take it from here. We're going to talk about uh, candlestick math and, and go into detail. Thank you, Michael, and thanks, Big Mike, and happy anniversary to you as well. Um, obviously, it's a pretty big accomplishment to uh, get as large as you have and, and do, have done as much for traders as you have over the years. It's really, really amazing. Hey, hey, Bob, before so you keep going, we're having a hard time hearing you. Your volume is not as good as it was before. Let's see. How about now? There we go. Thanks. How about if I talk a little louder? How about if I talk like the Italian that I am? <laughs> that? Sounds good. Italian. There you go. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking about is the concept of candlestick math. And candlestick math was essentially, it's a very simple concept. It was essentially developed uh, by my longtime partner, Mike Arnold. And it's really kind of unique, and it's, it's a different way of looking at things, but we think it's a way that shines a little bit of light into the darkness of what some individual traders have issues with, most individual traders have issues with. So if it's okay with you, I'm in the habit of reading the risk statement, only because we at Top Stack Trader actually take it very seriously. We're not just trying to cover our rear ends. So... This presentation is for information purposes only and does not constitute investment advice, nor an offer, solicitation, or recommendation to acquire or dispose of any investment or to engage in any other transaction. This presentation is not intended for solicitation purposes, but only for use as general information. All descriptions, examples, and calculations contained in this publication are for illustrative purposes only. The risk of loss in trading the foreign exchange, futures, and equity markets can be substantial. You should therefore carefully consider whether such trading is suitable for you in light of your financial condition. Past performance is not now, nor is it ever indicative of future results. So, what is candlestick math? Candlestick math essentially is a concept that can help traders control their actions while feeling the extreme emotions of trading. I'm assuming the vast majority of you, if not all of you, have been in a live trade in, in your lifetime, in your trading career. And if you haven't noticed it yourself, the only time that you're thinking clearly is before you put the trade on. Uh, I've been doing this about 21 years. 
Mike's been doing this 15, 15 yeah. years easily. Uh, my partner, Mike Arnold, 22 years. We still get emotional during trades. Yep. And the key to it is actually being able to understand your setup before you put a trade on, and then being able to manage your actions and control your actions during the trade. And that's what we believe candlestick math helps you do. It shines a light into the darkness of living tick by tick, or pip by pip, or point by point, or bar by bar, or candle by candle, whatever it is that you look at, and whatever it is that you're staring at on your screen that is actually making you overly emotional during the trade. It helps to clearly illustrate that the noise you see on a chart between the entry of a trade and the exit, whether the result is a stopped out trade or a profit target reached, isn't necessarily important enough to make changes to your original trade setup. It's a very, very important point. We train a lot of traders, we scout a lot of traders, and one of the things that I think Michael will agree we see a lot is irrational actions while in the trade as opposed to sticking with your plan, sticking with your strat what your strategy was. And that's the whole point of why Mike Arnold developed Candlestick Map to help teach and help see clearly a way to get past these things. It's very easy to say that people need to master trader psychology, but you need tools to actually be able to see why these things don't matter, as opposed to just taking our word for it. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of a bar or a candle. A bar evolves over time, and I'm talking about a bar or a candle on a typical price chart. For example, a weekly bar takes a whole week of trading to finish before it looks like it does at the end of the week. This is a little bit of theater of the obvious, but bear with me for a second. We at the College of Trader Development always say that the most important price on any candle or bar is the closing price. Now, that doesn't mean that the high, the low, or the open are insignificant. The contrary, the high and low especially are very important. But the most important price on any bar or candle, in our opinion, is the close. The reason for that is very simple. Whatever time frame you're trading in, you're not the only one trading in it. And every single participant looking at that time frame has agreed that that is where the market should be priced at the time that that time frame ends. Whether it's a, a last second rally or a last second sell off or something that's slowly ground up or down all day, the closing price is where the market agrees the price should be. So it just holds that much more. And Bob, to add to that, trading on the floor uh, for about seven or eight years, trading on the floor, that was a big topic of, of a lot of traders in the morning. At the end of the day, where did it close? What was yesterday's close? What was settlement? Uh, people would even bet on settlements and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, closing prices was, was always something that was on a trader's mind. Uh, as far as floor traders, we see it all the time as far as screen traders uh, and, and, the, and those that were scouting. Uh, talking about where things closed and, and all that kind of stuff. And again, it's, it's time frame based, obviously, but even when you go out to the hedge fund world where I have a lot of experience in, they're looking at weekly closes, quarterly closes, performance for a hedge fund or a mutual fund, they have a closing point, whether it's quarterly, annually. So the close is the most important price. Again, I want to stress, that does not mean that the highs and the lows are unimportant. College of Trader Development, we draw our trend lines from highs and lows. We don't draw them from closes. But the close is the most important price on a bar. An important concept that ties in with the closing price of a bar is to visualize what the bar looked like as the time frame unfolds to where it is on the close of the time frame. Now, a slide earlier I said that you shouldn't live tick by tick. What we're trying to say is you shouldn't be staring at your screen every single second and watching the price move up a tick, down two ticks, up three ticks. But knowing what the bar looked like is really the basis of candlestick math. And you'll be able to see as I go along what I'm talking about. So was it a very bullish bar that turned bearish? Was it at one point a very bearish bar that is completely reversed and turned bullish? Let's take a look at a visual representation of the evolution of a bar. So here we have the first candlestick on a 30-minute chart. It's 8.35, the market opens, we've got a little bit of a bullish move. 9 o'clock, the bullish move continues. It's the morning, there's some volume to it, but nothing crazy yet. Now let's say a number comes out, all right, and the 9.30 bar, there's a little bit of a sell-off. You decide to go short on the number, and it's looking pretty good around 10 o'clock, right? And you keep going, about 10.30, it comes back a little, uh, you know what, I'm not down that much, those four highs still kind of held, I'm okay, but now it looks like it's getting a little bit stronger, and still stronger. And now it's lunchtime, so it's kind of slowing down a little bit, 
moving a little bit sideways, sideways maybe I'm going to be okay. All of a sudden it spikes, continues to climb, and it ends the day like you're showing here at 3.15. So essentially, around 9 or 9.30, it really looked like it was going to end up being a bearish day, especially with the way those candlesticks look, with the long shadows ending on their closes, or ending, closing on their lows, rather. But the market turned around pretty quickly, essentially fading the number. Let's take a look at how that actually played out during the course of the day. Got anxiety right now, Bob. Watch right. That. Yep. And you see that moving up and down like that. You watch that candle moving up and down, depending on the time frame you're looking at. That's a daily candle. Now, if you walked into your screen at the end of the day, you hadn't traded all day, and you looked at this candle right here and say, "Oh, it's a pretty bullish day." Well, not the entire day. Okay, there was some down movement there. Let's take a look at another example. Let's say. At 8.35, we end up with a little bit of a, of a down trade. And still not bad. The highs again are holding. 9 o'clock, some number comes out. Goes a little bit lower again. You decide to go short again on this one. It rallies up a little bit. Those highs are still holding. It's 10.30 now. And into the start of lunch, it's still holding. So you feel pretty good about your position. Now we're starting to get some long shadows on the bottom. Uh-oh, here comes the rally I was afraid of. And it's continuing. Now everybody's back from lunch. It's still continuing. Wait, am I okay? Did I did I move my stop? Did I get stopped out yet? The day continues on, and there you have where the day finished. Now again, if you looked at this particular candle at 3:15, you walked away from your screen all day, came in at 3:15 and saw this candle. Wow, that day was just a complete sell-off. Nothing happened but a sell-off, right? Well, you can see that it opened here rallied up and completely collapsed, but you don't know when that happened. You don't know if it happened on the number. You don't know if it happened on the open. It essentially happened around lunchtime. Why does that matter? Well, it may not, but depending on the type of trade you were in and the position that you held while this particular price action was going on, this middle area of rally may have spooked you out of a position. And again, the amount of people that are in here right now, I'd be willing to bet that 100% of you have been spooked out of a position by some middle of the day move going against you, especially if you're a trader who does not trade based on risk. If you're somebody that is focused so much on reward that you put excessive risk on to the point where if the market even starts to move a little bit against you, you get stressed out only to see your trade eventually go to target. So again, watching the way that you play out next to each other is what gets traders stressed out. It's this up and down. Am I going to make money? Am I going to lose money? I can't really tell. And as the bar is playing out, you stare at it, and you get this anxiety, and you get this emotion, and this emotion is very difficult to control. Eventually shakes you out sometimes, too. I mean, how many traders have we seen that happen to? I, we see it all the time, and, and that's one of the, the greatest things about uh, the, the vantage point that we have is that we can see that at all different levels. We can see that in, in, uh, with recruits in the, the combine. We can see that with funded traders. We can see that with a trader that's developing and that they don't get shaken out of a trade like that. They, they, they trade their plan and they stick with it and they know what to tweak after that. Um, they let it play out because if you don't let certain things like that play out, you will uh, not have the validation if it's working or not working. So let's give you a little background as to why we even teach candlestick math if it's not necessarily entries and exits. And I know that's what people always want when they come into a webinar. They want the new entry and exit, something they don't know. How can I make more money? But candlestick math can help a trader in several ways. The trader can start by analyzing groups of candles or bars and compressing them into a single bar to determine the bullishness or bearishness of that group of bars. This is actually much more valuable than it sounds. We'll show you this graphically. The second benefit, and what I think is the most important benefit, comes from the analysis it can help us from a psychological perspective. When you do this analysis, your psychology is actually getting a tool, okay, something that subconsciously seeps into your brain to tell you, relax, I don't know how my trade is going to turn out yet. I planned my trade out at the only point in time where I was calm. It's kind of appropriate now because the Blackhawks game yesterday, right? Would anyone have thought it looked like the Blackhawks were going to get stopped out? Yeah. And in the last 17 seconds, their trade actually went to target. Yep. Right? Yep. So this happens in trading all the time. And, and 
I think, believe it or not, we actually graphically showed you the Blackhawks game on those evolution. Yeah, of and to even to even use that the Blackhawks and and keeping the psyche their psyche intact, keeping the focus intact, uh, trading, and then a lot of you in here do know this. Some people that are very new to trading don't know this. Psycho the psychological like the psychological aspect of trading uh, is something that. I would, and I, I, my career changed when I spent the most time dedicating to understanding uh, uh, what shakes me out of things, uh, how my psyche is, is responding, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So getting caught up in those little things and without staying focused on your, the calm waters that were before you even got in the trade is going to uh, gonna get you nowhere. So you got to stay focused. If you're not a hockey fan, I mean, the Blackhawks stuck to their plan. They, right? Yeah. They, they just continued to play the game till the game was finished. True professionals. Yeah. Essentially, you know, it's it's a fortunate example for us in Chicago, but that's exactly what happened. And candlestick math also helps you stick to the trading plan that Mike was talking about. Take the correct entries and sit through the noise of the trade and wait for your target or your stop to be reached. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw something in here right now that's not really... Uh, necessarily a function of this particular subject matter, but remember that there's only three possible outcomes to a trade. It's either a win, a loss, or a break even. Two of those are good, but all three of them are possible. And what we see a lot is traders not accepting that their trade can be stopped out. It is one of the possibilities of the trade, so you do have to consider it as a possible outcome. I'll go for example today. A uh, uh, majority of uh, the funded traders and the majority of those in the combine, they uh, they got creamed in crude today. So I don't know if you guys are trading crude oil today, but a lot of traders got uh, uh, shaken up, got tossed around with the noise. Uh, I think there was a lot of sideways action in the crude today. Didn't really stay. It stayed range bound. But uh, a lot of people were discussing that and, and, and talking about how they got caught up in the noise. It becomes very costly getting caught up in the noise. And in the end, we're not here just to trade. We're here to make money trading. So we want to figure out how to do this. So we talked about living candle by candle. One of the challenges many traders face is that once they put on a trade, their emotions can change as each subsequent candle or bar forms on the screen. This can happen especially before the next candle closes. You're watching a live candle and you don't know the outcome of that candle. You can tell me you do, but you don't. Remember the prior slide when we watched the candle unfold during the day and that candle was not finalized, obviously, until the 315 candle? Let's look at something here. A challenge for many traders is they want their trade to immediately go to target. Now. Some of you might have researched your strategies with a time component involved. If you have, I'm not speaking to you. However, the vast majority of you, when you research a strategy and you say, well, over the last 100 trades, this went to target before stop 70 times. A lot of the times, you're not tracking the time. You're not tracking how much noise there was in between. You're just saying, okay, I got in at 1,500, and it went to 1,550 before it went to 1,480. Okay, that's what most of you do. But you're not tracking, wow, there were 26 candles in between before it did that. But then the minute you're in a trade, you want to count the candles. Unfortunately, many good trades don't go immediately to target. And traders that do this tend to watch the candles unfold and continue to analyze what it means to their trade when, again, when you were first reaching it, researching your strategy, you didn't do that. This constant analysis can lead the trader to change his or her behavior and consequently modify the trade in some fashion. So now you're not even trading the research to trade. You're trading some hybrid of it. That hybrid could be a negative. And Bob, I, early on in my career, I remember getting to a point where I ended up speculating on what I thought the, tr the, the candle would, would end up looking like. And that, that's what I would get to a point in and, and not uh, uh, getting caught up in that noise, I guess this is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, the first account I ever had, I blew out because I was never wrong. Yeah, yeah right. Clearly I was. The trader might modify a stop or target in a manner that's not consistent with their plan. The trader may even exit the trade completely. That's actually one of the worst things. Let's take a look at another little graphic example. Now, granted, this is created. Okay, this is not an actual chart we're showing you, but these things happen all the time. And I'll be uh, willing to guarantee, again, that 100% of you can recognize this kind of a thing. So right here, just a classic chart pattern. We've got a potential double bottom reversal entry. 
Okay, it's pretty clean because we created it, so it's going to be that way. So here we have our confirmed double bottom entry. You can see the, the target represented by the green line up above. It's a measured move, so the target's pretty static. And we've got our stop below what we call significant levels. That's something that we teach in the college, but just for the sake of the conversation, our stop is below that level. So now we're in our trade. We're confident. We've seen these work 67% of the time, so we're good. Next candle, yep, I'm the king. I am so smart, you can't even believe how good I am at trading. I'm already spending it, Bob. What's happening here? Yep. It came up and came really close to my target, and now it closed on the lows. Well, I, I, that's not what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to go to my target. So you know what? I can't accept losses. I'm not the kind of trader who can accept losses. So I'm moving my stop to break even, and I'm getting stopped out because the next candle ticks down a little bit, and that stops me out. Okay, I just said three possible results of a trade. Two of them are good, right? So I got stopped out of break even, no problem. And now it goes to target. You cannot tell me this hasn't happened to every single person listening to me right now. I know it's happened to you. For sure, it's happened to me. And the, the emotional ups and downs that you take just to get for those three, the three green bars right there and what you're feeling, the, the euphoric feeling that you're there, and then that first pullback, you're already... That your your already high water mark of that trade is what you where you're locking into your head is I, I'm confirmed that I did traded well I feel really good about myself that pullback happens you still want to be back at that high water mark but you're not you're you're waiting for it to go back there I'll just get out of my stop and a lot of time you feel like you're eliminating pain because you feel like this money was yours mm -hmm. when the market was up at the here. high yeah but the reality is it's not. Yep. The money is not yours until you've exited the trade at a profit. The loss is not accepted until you've hit your stop. So taking it back to the psychological uh, roller coaster you put yourself on trading, it, it, it just it's so taxing. And it's one of those things that you do need to focus on and you do need to work on. Let's get another example. So here we've got a nice bullish move. We've got a couple of red candles. Bullish move seems like it's continuing. You've got a trend line here, and if you're a swing trader, you might recognize that a break of this trend line could potentially be a good short signal, right? So we've got a confirmed trade entry here. Again, we've got a significant level at the top. We've got our target down here in green. We've got our risk reward better than one to one, so we're all set. We've, this time we've accepted our risk, and we're completely fine. And again, it's working for us, right? We are really good traders. Girls are all excited. If you're a girl, the guys are all excited. We're really smart. We're gonna, I'm buying dinner tonight. News comes out. Now, by the way, this exact scenario happened to me. Different result than this slide is going to be. This exact scenario happened to me in crude oil this past non-farm, just so you know. I was in a trade that almost reached its target. It was a... Uh, a long trade, so the candle was red. But anyway, let me continue. Candle goes up, and I just don't want to be stopped out. I had so much money in my pocket already. I just don't want to be stopped out. Maybe I took too much risk in the first place, and now that it's actually getting near my stop, I just, I just get me out. I'm going to lose a little bit of money, and I'm fine. Now what? Now, is this actually going to, yep, goes to target without me. The trade actually goes to target without me again. Why? Because I was living candle by candle. When I first calculated the trade out, I had a stop and I had a target. When I researched this particular trend line entry, I didn't look for these candles and say, I'm not going to take any that have these candles in them. Okay, I just said, is it going to go here or is it going to go here? Oh, in my research, this one worked, so that's the trade I'm going to take. But when you're in an actual live trade, Okay, when you're in an actual live trade, this feels a lot different than when you're just looking at, here's my entry, here's my target. Oh, that one worked. So let me mark that down in my research as a time when it worked. It's just a lot different. What does any of this have to do with candlestick math? Candlestick math is simply adding two or more candlesticks together to produce a new candlestick. And this is useful in a couple of different ways. First, it can help a trader who is emotionally charged and reacts to constant market action. This is something, again, Michael will tell you, we see it all the time. I'm not, I'm not involved in the scouting of traders. These guys do it all day, and there are guys that just cannot stand the market action when they're in a trade, but yet they're smart as can be when they're not in a trade. Secondly, it can help analyze a group or two more, a group of two or more candles and determine the bullishness or bearishness of that particular group of candles. We'll examine that concept later in the slides, but I'm going to show you how all of these fancy candlestick patterns 
actually are, it's essentially candlestick math to form basically either a hammer or a shooting star, but we'll show you that in a little bit. So let's talk about how you do candlestick math. Candlestick math is relatively simple. It involves taking the highest high of all the candles and the lowest low of all the candles, the open of the first candle and the close of the last candle, and drawing a new candle with those levels. That's all it is. So you take this bearish candle, you take the high here in the open, we add it to the second candle, which has a lower low but and a higher close, and you essentially come up with what those two candles candles combined really did look like. Now, if you're looking at those two candles, a lot for a lot of people, this may give you some sort of market signal. But for the vast majority, this will give you a clearer market signal. Okay? Now people always say, well, why don't I just move to a higher time frame, move to a lower time frame. I'm not necessarily telling you to do this mid-trade. What I'm telling you to do is if you're one of those people that has trouble because you trade five-minute charts and every single move scares you out, or you trade 15-minute charts and every single move scares you out, one of the things Candlestick Map does, it allows you to create hybrid chart time frames. I can take seven candles off of a five-minute chart and create a 35-minute chart. I can take three 30-minute charts and create a 90-minute chart just visually without having to change all my charts around. Now, it has uses during live trades, but really what this is all about is trying to get you guys to understand that the initial movements do not necessarily matter. Let's take a look at that first example where the trader panicked and moved their stop to break even. We're going to add the candle after the entry to the following candle which caused the movement of the stop. So here was the candle, and then there was the candle that caused him to move his stop. And essentially, that's what that candle looked like. Now, when the trader got nervous because this was very near to his target, and then it closed on its lows, and it's a red candle with a long shadow, this doesn't necessarily look like a bullish candle to me. But it did close higher. It did. So it's entirely likely that someone may see this and say, yeah, there was a little bit of a sell-off at the highs, but you know what? It closed higher. I think I'm going to stay in this one. Let's do it one more time, but also add the following candle that caused the stop out. So here's the candle after the entry candle, the candle that caused the stop to be moved, the candle that caused the stop out. Essentially, you have what candlestick traders will call a long-legged doji. Again, if this is the only candle you're seeing, all this is telling you is that the market didn't move. It opened and closed in the exact same spot. And what did we say is the most important thing? The close. So yeah, there was a rally and there was a sell-off up at the top, but it opened and closed at the exact same spot. The market didn't actually move. If you were looking at a line chart, it would just be straight. Unfortunately, many good traders, I'm sorry, many good trades do not go to their target immediately. Traders get impatient if the trade takes longer to reach its target than they want it to. Normally, again, in your research, you don't do that. Okay, You just see how many times it goes to target versus going to what you think your stop should be. This impatience can lead to, mod this impatience, I'm sorry, can lead to modifying or even exiting the trade, and candlestick math can help from a psychological perspective to overcome this issue. This is a really good example. So, Let's do a little bit of charting here again. We've got a move. We've got a trend line that is drawn from some, some price action that's off my little slide here. And there we get a close, and that is a potential, again, a swing going from short to long. It's a valid entry to the upside. We find our significant level to place our stop below. We find our target, and the market kind of moves our way a little bit, but then it just goes sideways. Now, before I continue this, how many of you are like, this trade's going nowhere? I'm getting out of it. I saw this today in crude, and I saw uh, a handful of our crude traders, funded ones, which uh, is disheartening when you see them uh, get caught up in this. Two of them, for example, I pulled aside and said, hey, guys, add it up together, because we were talking about candlestick math. They know about uh, college trader development. They know about the candlestick math course. Uh, and, and putting that together, uh, the damage was already done to a couple of these guys' accounts. Uh, for the day, so it was more teaching, making that day turn into a teachable moment or learnable moment, so at least you get something out of that day. You always want to turn your day into something, even if you're getting taken on the chin. So that's looked like crude oil today, 
And talking about that earlier, Bob, that's a lot of them got caught up in that. And a lot of that noise, a lot of that ups, you know. And this again is the thing, like the whole point of this is getting traders to understand that when you place the stop, you are accepting your risk, okay? A lot of people would have moved their stop or gotten out at this point, okay? Now again, I created this chart, but you can't tell me you haven't seen this, okay? And now again, the range of markets. Markets. Yeah. Here's, here's the one where it's like, you know what? It's back to my entry. I'm so tired of this trade. I'm just getting out. That's enough. Mm -hmm. okay, I can't take it. I can't take being in this trade not knowing if I'm going to make or lose money. When actually, before you got in the trade, you did know if you were going to make or lose money. You were either going to make money or you were going to lose money. You know, did you ever hear that old joke, I know the score, the score of the game tomorrow before it starts? It's zero to zero? <laughs> this is that same kind of concept. When you enter a trade, you might get stopped out and you might go to target. Why do you need it to happen so quickly? hit the target without you. And we see this constantly. Constantly we see this. Where people are just bored with a trade. They can't stand to watch it anymore. The, the anxiety of potentially getting stopped out builds and builds and builds. But you don't have the balancing joy of possibly hitting a target offsetting that anxiety. You think that because there are this many candles moving sideways that you're more likely to get stopped out than you are to hit your target. And to date, I haven't seen any data that says that. So let's take the original entry, entry at the close and do some candlestick math from the candle after the entry to the candle when the trade was exited. So let's just put all of these that I just showed you in the last slide and add them all up. And this is where going to a higher time frame doesn't necessarily help you. And what do you get? Just a long-legged doji. No big deal. If I could right now, I'd like to take these out and slide this doji over to here and then put the target candle next to it. And you tell me, if that was the way that the trade played out, have you made more money than you did when you dealt with all this noise as it went to target? The amount of money this trader made is the exact same as the amount of money the other trader would have made. It just took longer. You don't make more money because it moves quicker. Now I'm talking trade for trade, of course. All right, so essentially the market went nowhere, and that fact shakes you out of your trade. It's silly. And it gets your blood boiling. It does. Yep. And then it gets you worked up that it goes to target. It's almost worse when you get out than when you, get, when you stop out. Yep. Because when you get out like that and you say, I'm just getting out of the trade, and then it goes to target, you feel like you lost twice. Mm -hmm. Traders tend to get more upset about trades that they could have made money on. I talk about this all the time when people say you left money on the table. Trading is not walking into a room with a bag of money, putting it down on the table, and then only taking half of it out and walking out of the room. You're taking money from other willing participants that are consensually willing to lose it to you. Okay, it's not your money. So if you have a move that makes you $1,000 and then it goes another $1,000 in the direction you were initially in, you didn't leave money on the table. It wasn't yours. You took the money that you planned to take. Let's look at some basic candlesticks. In this next section, we're going to take a look at a few individual candlesticks with their traditional interpretation to see if we can come up with the same conclusion based on what candlestick math shows us. This is almost making a different point. We'll then take a look at some classic multi-bar formations to see if we can come up with the same interpretation. So there's something in candlestick analysis called a bullish belt hold line and a bearish belt hold line. A bullish belt hold line is a long bullish candle that opens on its low and closes near its high without creating a very large shadow. It essentially looks like this. A bearish belt hold line is a long bearish candle that opens on its high and closes near its low without creating a shadow. Now again, these are traditional candlestick patterns that you would learn in any candlestick course. Here's what the bearish belt hold line looks like. Here's what they would look like on a chart. You can see the bullish belt hold line is right there. You can see the up move afterwards. Bearish belt hold line is right there. We have a gap, but we still have a down move. Okay. Well, let's take a look at something. A hammer is a small real body, either bullish or bearish, with a long lower shadow that is two times the height excuse me, of the real body, and little or no shadow at the top. It's a possible reversal signal after an extended bearish move, and they look like this. Okay? 
And then a shooting star is a small real body, either bullish or bearish, with no long upper shadow, and little or no shadow at the bottom. I'm sorry, with a long upper shadow, and little or no shadow at the bottom. It's a possible reversal signal after a bullish move. And here's what they look like. Now let's do something fun. Here's how they look on the chart. Again, there's a hammer. And there's a shooting star. You can see the subsequent moves that are predicted by those particular candlestick. Now let's look at some traditional combinations of candles. In candlestick analysis, there's something called a bearish harami. It's a large, real body bullish candle, followed by an inside bar small bearish candle. Okay, so it looks like this. Now look what happens when I add those two together. This is normally considered a bearish pattern after an extended move. Where have you heard that before? It's essentially a shooting star. So now we've got the complication of looking for a bearish harami when essentially, if you just understood visually, at a glance, candlestick math, you realize that it's just a shooting star. There's what a bearish harami would look like. So now while some of you are waiting to see if this is going to be a bearish harami, if you're doing candlestick math, you can see that it's at least going to be a shooting star, depending on where it goes. A bullish harami, essentially the same in the other direction, a large real body bearish candle followed by an inside bar small bullish candle. And again, if we add those two together, this is normally considered a bullish pattern after an uptrend or extended bearish move, but it's essentially a hammer. So now we've taken a bearish harami and a bullish harami and shown how they're essentially either a shooting star or a hammer. The same thing happens with a dark cloud cover, which is another traditional multi-bar candlestick pattern. It's a large real body bullish candle followed by a bearish candle with a gap open higher than the bullish candle high, and it closes back down well inside the first bars. Wow, that's even too much to read, right? That's even too much to read. That's what it looks like. Okay, so you've got the large, excuse me, bullish candle, then you've got the gap open, and then it closes past the 50% point of the large bullish candle. But again, when you add these together, this normally bearish reversal signal, what do we have there? Seen this before in the presentation? Essentially, we have a shooting star. Piercing pattern, a large real body bearish candle followed by a bullish candle with a gap open lower than the, okay, same thing the other direction, mm -hmm. right? Large bearish candle, gap open, down here, closes past the 50% point of the prior candle. You add that together, this is normally considered a bullish reverse, what do we really have? Hammer. We have a hammer. Okay, they're all the same. How about bullish or bearish engulfing patterns? First real candle has a, real, a small real body, followed by a candle of the opposite color, which is an outside bar. Hammer. It's normally considered a reversal signal after, one, uh, after an extended move in one direction. How about the bearish one? Shooting star. Essentially, you look at this candlestick map, you put these things together, and the combination of these candles is producing the exact same things over and over again. We can do this all day. Let's look at an evening star. I'm just going to put it together. I'm not even going to talk about it. An evening star is basically a large bullish candle, a small body candle with a gap. The third candle closed well within the body of the first candle. You've got the gap there or a window, which is typically called in Japanese candlesticks. You add those together. What do we end up with? A shooting star. Okay, again, normally considered a major top reversal pattern. All right, so. What is the point of all this? Why am I going through all these? Because we can go through a lot more of these. The point is there's no memorization of these patterns needed. Okay, there really isn't. We could analyze patterns all day and we would come up with the same thing. The important thing is that with what you're now learning, you don't have to go through and memorize a bunch of patterns. You can use a high, low, open, and close relationships along with the concept of candlestick math to start noticing key market signs. You must also learn about the concept of location, which we're not going to do here, to help reinforce and apply these patterns. Obviously, these things happen at locations. That's when they actually have power to them. You don't want to see a shooting star or a hammer in the middle of a congested area and assume that that's going to, to be the precursor to some sort of large move. It doesn't necessarily happen. But 
The point is you don't need to go and memorize a bunch of patterns. You don't need to get yourself off of the, the shorter time frames to go to the higher time frames to see if the chart is actually doing what you want it to do. This is meant to illustrate to you guys that noise is essentially it has very little to do with whether or not you should change what you've done when you originally set up your trade. I would argue it has nothing to do with it. Unless you have a situation where your particular research strategy has a time component or has an intra-market price action component to it, then that's a whole other subject. But if what the vast majority of you, of what I know the vast majority of you are doing, you're researching patterns and you're saying, I need to go here before it goes here a high percentage of the time and I'm going to keep my risk reward proper. If that's what you're doing, then candlestick math is something that you should pay attention to because it doesn't just help you get over psychology. It gives you a practicing tool to help you see why what your brain is telling you is actually incorrect. We put into, the pra into practice the concept of candlestick math along with other concepts to perform single and multiple bar analysis and come to a conclusion about the potential bullishness or bearishness of price action. We also want to help you understand that you can learn to read a chart through price action and bar or candle relationships. You don't have to go through and learn 20 different patterns to understand that they're essentially all bullish or bearish signals. Everything you need to know is on your charts. Every bar, every candle gives you absolutely everything that you need to know about what's happening during that particular day. Candlestick math is a basic concept that can be very powerful for both the analysis of candlesticks as well as helping a trader overcome disempowering trading behaviors. If you are moving stops or if you are exiting trades for some of the reasons that we've described here, only to see them go to your targets afterwards, I would suggest that you grab a bunch of charts and you start playing around with some candlestick math and see exactly how pointless that actually is. Exiting a trade that you researched at the only time when you're thinking clearly, which is before you get in a trade. This disempowering behavior essentially happens before any candle closes. The combination of two or more candles can help you recategorize market moves and give you greater insight into what is really going on in the market, and more importantly, to control what is going on within yourself. When I had that crew trade on during non-farm payrolls on that past Friday, okay, I saw this big red candle going against me, and my 21 years of experience was still not strong enough to get rid of the urge to get out of that trade. Do you know what got rid of the urge for me? Knowing that the combination of all those candles I was looking at, because I've been doing this for so long, uh, Mike Arnold showed it to me about three or four years ago, and I've just been screwing around with it ever since. But putting those candles together in my mind was telling me that that particular down move was not that big of a deal in the macro view of my trade. From the time I entered, to the time that my stop or target was going to be reached. That one candle, that one downdraft, meant absolutely nothing for the structure of my trade. So this is what we mean by more importantly, it's going to help you control what's going on with yourself. This is like an exercise. Trading in an odd way is like boxing. You can't go into a boxing ring and expect to win a boxing match without getting hit. What you're trying to do is get hit and have it not hurt, and hit the other guy more. Candlestick math is a real good way of understanding how to set up your punches in a fight, all right, in a boxing ring. You look at this and you say, yeah, I'm probably going to get hit during the course of this trade. But you know what? When I combined all these candles in my last trade, it was pretty much straight up for me. The trade actually pretty much went straight up. I can take some of these examples in here, combine all the candles, and even though there were basic moves, if you remember the evolution of a bar slide, even though there were huge downdrafts in that one, it finished up. And had you walked away from your screen and just left your stop and target in place, that trade would have been good. You would have looked at your screen on a daily chart, let's say, and said, wow, put on the trade, went right to target. Just happened to take a day. So as you guys can see, Thompson Trader, we partnered up with Bob uh, 
about six months ago because he agreed, he brings great education. The university, the College of Trader Development uh, course that, that we have partnered up with him and put under our university, is uh, this is just one piece of that. Uh, we wanted to bring it to your attention. Uh, it is something uh, just like anything that's out there. It's a tool that you can use to help you develop your trading. College of Trader Development. You want to develop your trading. It is the, the proposition of becoming a successful trader. Uh, clicking here, buying there. It sounds so easy. Uh, the hard work is putting on the work boots, the, the overalls, and getting out there and getting your hands dirty. Uh, this is just one way of getting your hands dirty. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Big Mike for having us on here. I want to thank Bob Iacchino for, for his great content, his great uh, teaching abilities, and, and putting the College of Trader Development together for Top Step Trader. <clears throat> okay, so I let's... We, uh, yeah, yeah, so let's... Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's open it up for Q&A, and then I want to remind everybody to uh, stay tuned for the prizes that we're going to give away at the end. So let me take a look at the questions that we have up right now and invite anybody that has a question to go ahead and type that in. Let's see what we have. Uh, a couple of people asking about using like range bars or Renko bars with this. Well, essentially the concept is not that much different if you get shaken out of trades. When you talk about range bars and Renko bars, right, the whole idea is to potentially shake out some of that noise. So to a certain degree, those are doing it for you. But if you still find yourself getting shaken out of these, these types of trades, it's essentially the same thing. A Renko bar has a high and a low. A range bar has a high and a low. And you can still combine some of those and essentially eliminate some of the moves in your range bars. So it really depends on the trader and as to whether those particular types of charts are helping or hurting with you getting shaken out of the trades. If you're using range bars and Renko bars, okay, again, one of the main points of those charts is to take some of that noise out and to take some of that noise out of your psychology. So if it's still hurting you, I would suggest moving out to a higher time frame on those or rather a higher um, data input or actually performing candlestick math with those as well because it's, it's a pretty, it's a much simpler equation. Right. Well, I think that there's a very important underlying lesson here and you, you mentioned how so many people will arbitrarily move their stop really just based on emotion and they don't, it's almost like they don't realize it. I mean, they know what they're doing it, but you mentioned a good point that people will do the research beforehand and they'll lay out their stops and targets and they never really put the two together, it seems to me at least, that uh, whenever they're arbitrarily moving that stop, that wasn't part of their initial research. So they're almost always detrimentally affecting the trade. Well, absolutely. And you know, that's again, when, when you, change your plan when you change your path you're not trading the strategy you researched anymore okay you're not and this is a big problem uh, for Mike at the guys on the funding side because they'll fund guys who traded a certain way and then they'll all of a sudden start changing the way they're trading and Mike's issue is and I'm sure he's going to speak to this but his issue is you're not the guy we funded we want the guy that we funded in the first place and I think the first key comes down to your entries and that's where you're at because you don't have to move we work with uh, traders all the time you don't have to move a lot of your stops I can't tell you how many times when we start working with funded traders when they first start, they instantly get in them. Our, our fund of traders do incredible job of entries. We work on them on the the exits because you get to a certain point where they they get in the money, they move that stop to break even, and they get hit with. It. Well, if they stayed in that trade, didn't move that stop on the on those on those type of situations, that's because they picked a great entry point. Uh, they wouldn't have to move that stop, and they can let that trade play out. Uh, I see that more often than none. Everything is majority rule when I talk, and what I see is a majority rule. And finding great entry points is the key when you're talking about a, a certain stop that you go with and a certain target, uh, and not having to move that, not having to trail that or move that. Remember, right. guys, if you can't um, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Okay, so if you're researching a trading strategy and then you start changing it at the minute you put it into play, you your data is useless. All the work you did is gone. Right. So I guess there's two approaches. One would be in the initial research, you need to take into account what you're comfortable with when you're sitting there through the live trade and kind of apply that to the research so that you're going to do, you know, what what comes naturally to you. And then the second approach would be that uh, to do the research without the emotional side of things and then work on the live execution 
uh, of actually following the research instead of following your your emotions. You know, Big Mike, there's so many good traders out there and there's so many good strategies. I, I've never disparaged another strategy publicly in my life. The fact of the matter is if you're not trading the strategy that you researched, whatever goes into that research, whether you're researching a time component, whether you're researching a floating style, whether you're scaling into positions, whether you're dollar cost averaging, which is adding to a loser if you ask me, but whatever it is that you've researched, if you don't actually put that into practice live, you have no clue what you're doing. You have no clue if you're being successful or not. Yep. The funniest thing about real trading and true trading as a professional trader is the cash result of your trade isn't really the determining factor as to whether you put on a good trade or not. John it's, calls it a side effect. It's a side effect, yeah. right. <laughs> the actual success it comes from the process, it comes from sticking to the process. Yeah. I can flip a coin and buy Apple. And if they go up 50%, I'm a genius. I'm actually not. I'm an idiot because I bought a stock on a coin flip. Yeah. That's just dumb. Well, so, I, I guess too many people simply equate the they, – they move their stop you know, to break even after X number of ticks in their favor or um, – you move their stop or, or exit a trade because of you know the trade was sideways too long. Everything you covered, they do it because they think that they're minimizing risk. And I guess you have to understand that minimizing risk does not mean that you're maximizing profit. You know they don't. Really well, well, also we have to understand that the market tests areas, it tests levels, and if you're trading the level, it's going to test that. It may get a, deviate away from it a little bit, and then come back and test it. So if you're going to move your your break e or you're going to move your stop to break even, and and it's it's not. A well confirmed uh, uh, in a direction and it's still in the testing mode uh, which we talk about all the time and what we had a trader I think did that last week is John Hoagland our director of scouting called him out on it and said hey you know you had that trade you moved to break even it's trade around settlement when markets are trading around settlement they test I mean there's that's yesterday's close yep. and we talked about close it's a big big deal so you got people in both sides of it who's winning you got this huge tug of war back and forth back and forth and that's that's something that we help people try to understand and, and by getting them in the markets and, and learning their strategy and, and, and sticking with it uh, and, and day after day after day. So Right. So let's take a look at some of the other questions here. Futures Operator says, in the example of trailing your stop and getting taken out before the target, what about the flip side where it could also turn around and those red reverse candles and reverse uh, completely past your entry? and go on to a full stop. Since you don't know the outcome, isn't it better to take a small profit than a full stop once it's what, moved? What did you research? Okay, I would turn the question around on you. Did you research moving it, and, and did that come out good for you? And that's completely fine if it did. Look, I'm not telling you guys that if your comfort level based on your research is the minute it moves two ticks in your favor that you move your stop to break even. That's fine if that's what you research. But here's the problem. If you researched full targets and you research full stops, and now when you actually go trade, you do it differently. You are doing something completely different from what you researched, and that renders your research useless. Guys, there's a reason why we stay out of strategy talk uh, uh, in Top Step Trader because we use metrics and we say, all right, your average winner is this and your average loser is this. So if you keep that up, and yeah, you're booking profits, but if your average loser is always consistently bigger than that, you're net net losing. So you know that's still uh, that's validation that you need to work on what yourself and your trading plan. That's a great point. If you've researched, uh, let's say two to one reward to risk. And every time you get a trade, just because a red candle goes your way, or goes the other way, or a green candle, depending on whether you're long or short, and you start executing 1.1 to 1 reward to risk. Mm -hmm. Again, your research is now wrong. So you can't do that. Now, people say that all the time. Wouldn't it be better to take a small loss than a full stop? Do not put on a trade where you do not accept the full stop as one of the possible outcomes. Unless, again, there's something in your strategy that tells you that you have to have a large stop at first, and then you can move it. All right, but you're still, right. Ex you're still accepting that large stop. When you get on a plane, you're accepting that it might crash, whether you like it or not. When you get in a car, you're accepting that you might get hit by a runaway train. Okay, these things are real. Do you know that 450 people a year die getting out of bed 
When you get out of bed, you don't think about that because it's so minuscule, but it is a possibility. If you think you're going to be a trader and not experience losses, I suggest that you just shake Big Mike and Mike Patak's hands and say goodbye because you're going to have losses. You shouldn't be putting on trades where you haven't accepted your original stop as one of the outcomes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Losses are ordinary, necessary part of this business. They'll always be there. It's understanding your metrics, understanding you as a trader to then know what to work on to get there. So, you know, that is a, a going back to what Bob said, he turning the question around. There's different ways we could come back at that with that type of a question. Right. Yeah, I, I wrote down what Bob said at the top. I, I found it uh, pretty funny and, and accurate. Uh, he said, the first account I ever had, I blew out because I was never wrong. <laughs> that's, uh, that's perfect. <laughs> Um, and I guess, you know, it, it, people also have to realize it's not just as simple as not moving your stop. You know, if you've tested something and the research says that you need to apply some sort of discretion, then you have to do that. So, I mean, yeah. there, there's, there's not a lot of black and white in trading, that's no. what I always say. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of clear right or clear yeah. wrong. There's a lot of gray. You have to make decisions. Yeah. And, Mike, that's what we always talk about. That's why it takes time. And you have to be patient with that and let it develop. But you also have to stick to something to to validate what you need to change what's working and what's not working right okay so a few people have have asked about uh, the candlestick math portion adding up the candles versus simply having a like a smaller window or something that has a higher time frame chart so what's the What's the uh, comment or, or opinion there? I, I don't I don't have any issue with that. The candlestick math thing to me is more of an exercise. Mm -hmm. the, the higher time frame charts absolutely do that uh, for you, but it it renders you a little bit limited. Okay, because you can put up, you're not going to be able, as I said earlier, you're not going to be able to put up a 35-minute chart next to a 40-minute chart, next to a 45-minute chart, next to a 50-minute chart, next to a 55-minute chart, and if you're looking at five-minute charts, you're going to need all of those because you don't know which five-minute bar is going to be the one that scares you. It's the same thing if it's a 15-minute. You're not going to be able to have that many charts. It's better, in my opinion. Um, as Mike Arnold taught me, to be able to visually see it. Mm -hmm. And the only way to visually see it is to actually play with your charts a little bit on a Saturday or a Sunday. You know, don't read, don't read Barron's or the Wall Street Journal on the weekend. Go actually look at some of the work you did, your journals and your plan and rework that stuff and work some candlestick math in there. It so just you're... becomes easier to just look at it and see it rather than have to have... I mean, you're, you're going to be looking at your whatever minute anyway, your main, you right. know, your, your main chart. You're right. going to be looking at that anyway. Right. So if you want to look at the other ones and make that your main chart, you know. But it, it sounds like you're saying that um, instead of just an arbitrary number of two, three, or four times the the uh, entry candle size, you're you're almost waiting for that candle to be drawn that causes you to second guess yourself, and then you work backwards from that candle. Exactly. I mean, it's again, it's as much an exercise, a tool, to help you understand that some of the market noise that scared you before didn't need to. Right. But we do use it intraday during trades. And again, like yeah, I said, you just asking. can't have that many charts up. Right. Okay, Bob is asking, you know, going back to what you said at the top about the emphasis on the closing price, he's asking, uh, do you consider the closing price in relation to the the midpoint or center point of the candle between the high and low versus the prior open price or the prior close price, you know, which which is more important. You could technically have a bullish bar based on the prior close, but it could still be, you know, like a, a shooting star. So how do you place importance on one versus the other? Well, Bob, I think you went three or four steps past what I was trying to say when I said that. Essentially, what I'm saying is that every single candle gives you a certain amount of data. Okay, just looking at it, depending on the time frame you're looking at. You're seeing where the market decided to open. You're seeing how high the market got before the sellers took charge. You're seeing how low the market got before the buyers took charge. And you're seeing where all of those players agree the market should be. I wasn't necessarily making an assumption as to what that meant for your next trade. That's obviously a combination of candles, patterns, and location as well. Completely agree with what you say. You can have a bullish bar based on the prior open and all the totally agree. But all I'm trying to say is that again, the open of the prior candle is important in relationship to the next candle and in relationship to the prior candle's close. But when you're looking at just a candle, one candle, the close is the most important thing on there. Okay. Uh, Luke and a couple of others asking similar questions, so I'm going to combine into one. Basically the question is what is a good starting 
time frame to start out for? Um, what time frame do you guys recommend? So that's a loaded question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're just if you just want to practice candlestick math, I, I would go from five to fifteen minutes just because it has more candles. And if you have a screen like a screenshot program where you can take sections of your screen like a Jing or a Snagit or something, just randomly grab a section of candles and, and play around with it. You know, don't try and set it up so that it's easy for you. Make it a little bit more difficult. The more you work on it, the easier it becomes to just see. And again, when you're able to see these things, you'd be shocked. At Everybody talks about trader psychology. Okay, everybody says you have to get over your psychology. Your mindset has to be right. But how do we do it? Okay, this is one of the ways to do it. Grab a section of random candles from any chart. Okay, any chart. Take a daily chart, go to a, a, a continuous um, crude chart, something, and just grab a section of candles, start adding them together and say, okay, this looks like it was a pretty bearish move, but at the end of the day, it opened at, I don't know, $95 and closed at $95. And I remember when I got started in my career, I came out of college and, and I would print off uh, candles, or I would print, uh, follow candlesticks, and I would print off, Bob is much more detailed and understands candlesticks much more than I ever have. That's why I learn a lot from him when he does these. But uh, I would print these off and I would go out bartending and I was trading during the day bartending at night. It was the only way for me to do it because I had to have an income because I wasn't getting an income at the beginning of my trading career. So I would study those and and and... I would start with folding the paper over so I could see a uh, couple bars, a couple candlesticks, couple, and then keep and then create that, and then what was a high, what was a low, all that kind of stuff. Because I knew so many traders talked about that kind of stuff. I knew there was a significance there, and I knew I had to immerse myself in it to fully understand it. And, and I figured in every other profession, to be a professional, out of doctors and lawyers, you, I mean. If you're a doctor, you're a brain surgeon, you, you probably still know how to diagnose a cold. You know, so I wanted to get the basics down and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, a few people asking about whether or not they should incorporate a time-based stop. So instead of a you know stop loss based on price, should there be a stop loss based on time in the trade? Yeah, that's kind of like asking if you pep put paprika on your chicken. I don't know if you like paprika. <laughs> yeah. You know, again, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard, yeah, it's a strategy because I've had turned it two different ways. Uh, you know, one of our traders talks about uh, uh, what got you in the trade. If the same reason that got you in the trade are still there 15 minutes later, 10 minutes later, you're good. But if it's not, then... You know, now we're talking about something different. So, again, what Bob said about the chicken, yeah, <laughs> right. pretty good. Pretty just research. But I mean, it is it's a strategy. It's a strategy. That, yeah, right. it's research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it just takes time. Question. And there, there's right. no perfect. We're dealing with an art here, and there's no and mixing some science in, in with it. That's so the the answer yeah. would we teach. Sorry, the answer would come. <laughs> that delay kills us. Go ahead, Bob. Now, what I was going to say, in the College of Trader Development, we teach a complete strategy from start to finish. And at the end of it, you have an actionable strategy. None of that has a time component in it. Right. However, if you get into certain situations where time matters, okay, you can't hold trades overnight at some shops, things like that, then you have to adjust that a little bit. Even if you learn trading from someone else, you're going to make it your own. So it's really a very individual question. It's, it's right. very much like asking me how much should I risk per trade. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Are you worth $10 million or $10? So yeah. The answer will be different. So the answer basically should be determined on your own research. Put up put up 100 or 1,000 trades in, in Excel and then apply a time stop and see what happens. It's out of you, yeah. Uh, Hitesh is asking about applying this uh, methodology whenever you're scaling in or scaling out of trades. Any advice? Uh, top step trader, we only preach just uh, scale. If you're going to scale, you scale into winners. We do not even touch scaling into losers. Uh, what do you consider a loser? Well, that's going to be in your plan is what you consider a loser, never adding to that. So I'm just going to quickly say that right off the bat. I've seen it, and I'm going to talk majority rule from the trading floor. We call it cannonballing. Uh, that would turn to blowing out, which means you're adding to your loser, adding to your loser, adding to your loser, boom. Your account's gone. They're getting, you're, you're getting escorted off the trading floor by security. Uh, you know, our traders, as, as far as the fund level, cannot add to a losing position. They tell us what they deem a loser is. Uh, so that's kind of that. So I'll let Bob take it from here. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, again, you know, the scaling part, 
a lot of these questions are going to go back to what your strategy is and what your individual situation mm -hmm. is. Okay, scaling to me, the only responsible way to scale into something, let's say that your full risk per trade, you've decided it's going to be 4% of your tradable capital, you're going to scale in four times, you're going to do 1% each. We have a rule, never increase risk, only reduce it. We have another yep. rule, you decide your risk per trade, Okay, before you put the trade on, and you accept that that full risk may get taken out. So if you say that I'm going to risk 2% per trade, and then you buy 2% here, and then you buy another 2% lower, another 2% lower, you're being stupid. If you say my full, my full risk is 2%, you adjust your position size to put on a half a percent here, then a half a percent there, total of 2%, I think that's completely responsible. But I'm just speaking from a, from a standpoint of responsibility. Sure. If you're trading your own money, it's completely up to you if you want to blow your own account up. And we, and we, talk, I did. we talk about scaling too, and, and, and we never hear too many people, and, and I've dealt with over thousands of traders, and, and hearing them talk, and all, you never hear anybody talk about adding to winners because it's so damn hard to do. And, and nobody talks about that, but they instantly always talk about adding to losers because why? They got themselves into one. And what do they want to do? Well, they still want to be right, and they still want that. So, you know, that's something you're going to tackle on your own with repetition, and you want to do that in a safe environment, so however you want to do that. Uh, but uh, it's going to take time for you to, to understand what works for you. Right. Uh, Julie asking the question about stop placement. Um, she says, how far below or above resistance do you place a stop? The algos always seem to find them. Uh, I think it's a great to trade. A great trade is to ride the algos uh, back up once they tap the stop below support or resistance. So, you know, I mean, this is a this is a common question. So, what what do you guys have to say? So, I know in my career, one of the things that I, I did when I when I w would get stopped out, like uh, if you're, you're if you're noticing your algos are always hitting you on your stops and all that kind of stuff, and that's what you're calling it, or however you want to deem it. Uh, next time you go to put on that trade, here's what I would always do uh, to get over that certain period uh, was to basically wherever I was going to put on that trade and say it was a 15 tick stop, I would then act like I'm going to put it on the trade and then put the trade back up there working where that stop would be. And my fear of missing out, my FOMO, was the only thing I had to conquer at that point. Once I had that out of the way, I knew that, okay, if I, if, if I would get stopped out in that trade, I'm getting in at an excellent price. I'm going to like that. And if I miss it, I miss it. Well, I'm going to overcome something. I'm going to lose. Right. Something's going to lose its power right now. And that's, that's, you know, the fear of missing out was the only thing I tackled. So I got over that. And uh, that worked for me. And, and, again, that's a strategy that – that takes time and you have to do it over and over again to, to condition yourself that you're not scared to miss a trade, that uh, you're going to move to a better entry, uh, you know, but that's my levels way below that. But if you're always getting stopped out prior, then, you know, adapt and change and take notes and journal and that's all the kind of stuff. It, there's a lot yeah. of variables that go involved in understanding uh, how to tweak things up. I, I always call it the, basically the market's looking to take out the weak hands. That's how I yep. look at it personally. Because yep. it it's it's common, right? You could you can be right about the trade, and then the market's going to just test that and see, yep. you know, do we have the participation that we need to do whatever the desired outcome is. Yep. So I mean, it's, it's kind of a mental thing. You have to just think it through, and you too many people will get out, and of course, this still goes in the direction, so they they're upset, or mm -hmm. uh, too many people will will uh, uh, you know place a stop too close, and they get taken out. I consider it a weak hand to do that. No, I can, I can there's a, there, in the College of Trader Development, we teach um, placing your stops based on price action on the chart, not on a set of fixed, um, not on a fixed number of ticks or pips if you're in, in the forex markets. Right. And we do this for a very specific reason. Even we teach finding significant levels, which I can't really go, it, it takes three, four lectures to teach, but essentially we look for, for levels where the market has showed repeated significance, and then you'll still see that these little shadows or wicks go through those levels all the time. Mm -hmm. So what I essentially will do is I'll stretch my stop out as far as my risk will allow me. Now this is where we do things a little bit differently. I, I base all my trades on risk, not on reward. So I want to have my full risk on at all times, and I accept my full risk. Okay, so again, if it's 2% of my tradable capital, and let's say that 2% represents $200, okay, I don't want to have $175 of risk on. I want to have $200 on. 
because I want to get my stop as far away from this particular significant level because I do know that the algos, as you call them, will test these levels. I just say it's price action. I don't say who's testing it, who's not testing it. It doesn't matter to me. If somebody stops me out, I don't care if they're an institution or if it's Mike. It's the <laughs> exact same loss to me. Right. So I, I do it that way. And again, this fear of missing out, is, is that's a very interesting point. And I'll give you guys a little bit of a clue and then I'll stop talking because I tend to talk too much. Fear of missing out can be easily taken care of in your mind by considering the three possible outcomes of a trade again. A win, a loss, and a break even. Set up every single trade. As Mike said, if you're getting stopped out a lot, it's more about entry than it is about stop placement. It's more about where you're entering the trade. Okay? If you place a limit order somewhere lower to get a better entry as Mike does and you don't get that, it's break even. It's a scratch. It's a good thing. That was great. I got into a trade and I got out of break even. If you think about trading as putting on proper trades and protecting your capital, as opposed to putting on proper trades and doubling your capital, money happens to be, as John Hoagland calls it, a side effect of that. Mm -hmm. Money comes out of proper trade and proper risk uh, management. It doesn't come out of trying to double and triple up and get these huge moves. It comes out of putting on properly planned trades, accepting the risk, and then managing that risk correctly. Yep. Money is, is the outcome of doing those things. Okay, trying to get to a few more questions here. Ed is asking, for trade entry, would you have to wait for the high or low of the daily candlestick or get in at the middle and put your limits and targets at the high and low of the day? Uh, I, I don't know if I follow. Do you guys know what he's yeah, asking? I didn't really follow that. So Ed, really follow try, that. try again. I'm sorry, I don't follow that. Uh, let's see. Andros is asking, uh, he says, sometimes a trade will happen over 24 or 48 hours, but you suggest to close all the positions at the end of the day. Why Why is that? I think maybe he's just asking about the general rule the top step has to close. That's, a, that, that's, a, that's an equity partner rule that we partner up with. They don't want to be holding risk uh, into a close. I think if it was your own capital, uh, and we, we can, uh, our, our methodology, or I should say our, our uh, motto in, in a way is we give you the same opportunity you give yourself. So if you had your capital on the line and if it's over the weekend or if it's into the close, risk goes extremely high. Anything can happen out there. So that's one thing that, uh, you know, a top tip trader, and of course you can fund your own account and you can do all that kind of stuff, but when you're getting a funded account, uh, your risk uh, has to be off when the market is uh, electronic hours are closed. And now the, the electronic hours are basically tradable 23 hours a day in some markets. Right. Generally, if the market closes, you wait a few minutes and you can put your trade back on. Yeah. It's essentially the risk is gone at that point. Okay, uh, I'm just skimming the questions. We got most of them answered here. Let me see if there's anything left. Uh, so Futures Operator is, is asking for confirmation that primarily when using candlestick math, it's just uh, uh, visualizing it in your head. Well, uh, yes. I mean, the practice of it is is manual. It's right. part of the psychological yeah. uh, development. I mean, you're, you're, yes. and you're, you're developing there, too. And, and again, everything is not exact science and trading. You need to have we're, – we're all basic – artists of the markets. We call we call it types of trader call you athletes of the marketplace because we use a lot of sports analogies when you come over there because you are competing against other people. I can see them on the trading floor. I see them we're on the in the board of trade in the board of trade building right next to next to there's trading floors all around. My traders are trading against this guy in the elevator wearing wearing board shorts and, and, and flip flops, but I know he's doing <laughs> seven fifty a year. You know, so it, it just you know, I know my guys are up against him, so I'm going to make sure my guys are trained. And when I say guys, guys and girls that we're backing, those in the combine, because we care about that, and we want you to develop, and we don't want you in the market if you're not ready to be in the market. Great. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm skipping a couple questions that I think are kind of way off topic for this webinar. So um, if, uh, if I skipped your question and didn't get it answered, you can always email uh, top Step Trader directly. Their email address is right there on the screen, or you can help hit up their website. And uh, let me just see if there's a last couple of questions that are kind of on topic. Luke is asking, is it against the rules uh, with the combines to scale in on a loser? 
At the funded trader uh, level, yes, we do not want you adding to a loser. We're going to ask you what a loser is. So if you're buying crude oil at the price of 80, and then uh, uh, and then you you know say 10 ticks or 15 ticks is what you put your stop at. You know if you're adding to to it around that 10 or 15 tick area, yeah, that's adding to a loser. And you're going to be uh, having a conversation with with the director scouting before you get on a funded account. But yeah. I'm going to tell you guys, I've seen this way too many times, I, and, and I'm going to show you the, uh, the negative or tell you the negative aspect of it. I've, I've heard people adding to losers, adding to losers, adding to losers. I've heard them jump in front of a train here at the board of trade. I've heard of people kill themselves from the board of trade. G guys that put it on, put it on. Put it on the markets against yeah. them, against them, against them. So majority rule, I've not seen it work in my 15 years as a consistent trader. I don't see it work. Yeah, it I mean, there's a there's a big difference, account. right? Yeah. It is a big difference between account. big difference between uh, you know a position that that makes no the, the reason you got into the trade is no longer valid. That's a yes, loser. Yes, yes. Right? I mean that's yeah variables there too. Yeah. Right, but it's it, it is technically possible that if you decide to scale in, you know, at five tick increments. And that's part of your plan, and you're only putting on, you know, a small amount of size each one up to your predetermined I, max size. I, I, I would like to flip that, though. I would like to flip that on the individual and say, instead of scaling mm -hmm. in, in, in with it going against you, work on your your first method and your first approach. Should be my my method will be only scaling in if it becomes a winner, starts yep. going in the money. Right. So you can yep. overcome that FOMO. You dilute the value of or the fear of missing out. Right. There's a couple of threads on BNT about Martingale, and uh, I created one on anti Martingale. We're basically trying to add only to thank you, big to winners, and it's you know it's hard. It's hard to to think that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's let's see. Fawaz asking which one is less risky: a break even stop or an automatic trailing stop. Well, so, again, I mean, yeah, it's a tough one. It, it depends on the timing of it. If the second that your trade goes two ticks in your favor, you go to break even, well, you think, obviously can't trail at that point, so that would be less yeah, risky. Well, yeah. it's you, very strategic. What's the market state? What's yeah, the market state? We talk about exactly. that. Downtrend, uptrend day, or range bound day. If it's a range yeah. bound day, then, you know, I mean, so, I mean, you've got a lot of variables. You've got to understand, we want to be understanding what the market state is that day, how your market is trending, and all that kind of stuff. My, yeah, for wise, how about you tell us? What is your research? Tell, what does your research say? You know, I mean, that's the only way you're really going to ever know is to. Everybody has their own method, so you got to prove it to yourself. Otherwise, you won't have the confidence you need to trade it. Either way, yeah. whatever whatever the answer happens to be, you've got to prove it to yourself. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think this is a good place to stop the question. So, if anybody did not get their question answered, email support at topsteptrader.com. And now let's move on to the prizes. So we have what we have. Um, we have four. We have four uh, T-shirts. We have four hats. Guys, this is good TST swag, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and then we got four combines. So uh, we get people. We have people from 60 different countries, and we mail stuff out all the time. It looks looks cool. There's a lot of people that do wear it, uh, so it's good stuff. We're not just handing you some. Uh, some uh, what would I say? Some Hanes wife, you know, or, or uh, I should say, uh, t <laughs> polo yeah. or tank top or whatever. Yeah. So, um, so okay, there's eight. So, there's eight questions, right? And the, yes. the the first four questions, there's there's going to be the, the prize for each is a hat and a shirt. Is that right? No, the 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 uh, one person gets a hat, one person gets a shirt. So first and second. Okay, Please. gotcha. Okay, so one. Okay, so one one prize per person, but we're going to take two uh, of the correct answers per question. Yes, that that right? correct. Yeah. Okay. So I got. I, I'm going to throw some questions at you guys. <laughs> Here we go with this. So, uh, Mike, am I ready to go ahead and do this? Let me, yeah, let me say one final thing. And uh, okay. the way I'm going to get a hold of you guys, if you're one of the mm -hmm. winners, is I'm going to ask for your BMT username. So just have that ready for me, okay? All right, go ahead, Mike. And then uh, I'm going to let Mike uh, go ahead and tell me who the winner was. Uh, he knows the answers. Uh, so. Yeah, let me find that email. Hang on. Uh, well, Melissa sent it to me. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. So. This is all information, and, and with College Trader Development, it, it comes with quizzes in the program, and every quiz is from, there are questions from the actual content. That's where we're going to go here, because that's how you're going to learn. That's how we want you to know you're paying attention. That's how you want yourself developing as well, moving forward. Uh, what is the most important price on any candle or bar? Okay, so we have. Okay, we got enough. Yeah, yeah. wow, about 100 answers already. Um, and this this is for is it the hat? Is it right? This is for a hat. Yes. Hat. Okay. 
So I no idea people could type that. So it's a hat, a hat and T-shirt. So first and second. So the uh, first person that has clothes, the closing price, and the second person has the closing price. First person gets a hat. Second person gets a T-shirt. Okay, I'm with you now. Gotcha. All right. So the uh, the first person is Ryan M. I need your B and T. Uh, username, please. And let me nice work, Ryan. Put this down. So I'll put this right. So this is for the hat. And then the second person, uh, Stock Trader, BMP. Um, I guess that might be your username if you would just confirm that. And that's for the shirt. So let me see what we got. Okay. Perfect. Good job. Good job with that, guys. <clears throat> okay, I'm just writing this down. Okay, ready to go. So. Okay. Next. Second second question for you guys. Candlestick math is adding two or more candlesticks together to produce what? The answer is okay. a new candlestick. Right. Okay, so. So first person we, gets a hat, second right. person with a t-shirt. All right, guys, so you, you can stop typing. We got the answer. So I'm looking, uh, looks like Virage B, uh, P, Virage P, I need your BMT. Username, so that's going to be for the hat. Nice and work, then, Raj. And the second person, uh, I think, is uh, Druv Carr, and I hope I got close on that. Uh, Druv Carr, I need your BMT username, and that's going to be for the shirt. Druv Carr, nice. Okay, give me one second to write that down. No problem. And. Uh, there we go. Okay, so does that mean that the next questions are for the combines? Uh, so we got a t-shirt and hat still. Still, okay, so I, I, I'm just not, I don't understand. <laughs> you, you just tell me what the prizes are. How about the, 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 last, the last four questions, we got combines. They're a little bit more difficult. So last four, so I, I got three, uh, I got two, two questions done so far, and gotcha. now I got two more okay. t-shirts and hat questions. Right. So a total of four hats, total of four shirts. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Makes sense now. Go ahead. <laughs> Which ba Okay, here we go. This is for t-shirt first place and a hat second place. Which basic candlestick has a small real body, either bullish or bearish, with a long upper shadow and a little or no shadow at the bottom? The answer is okay. shooting star. Right. We've got the answer, guys, so you can stop typing. Uh, so Thomas, Thomas L., congrats on the shirt. Or, or hat. It's hat, right? Yes. Okay. And I need your BMT username, Thomas. And then let's see, the second person uh, is Spike13. And I need your, and that's for the shirt. I need your BMT username if that's, if that's not what it already is. So let me write this down. Okay, so Spike, I just need that confirmation on the username. Okay, great. I swear, guys. Guys or girls, sorry. Okay, so next. Okay, so here we got a, another hat and t-shirt combo. Uh, candlestick math is useful because it can determine, this is the fill in the blank. Candlestick math is useful because it d can determine the blank or blank of a group of candles. Candlestick math is useful because it can determine the blank or blank of a group of candles. So are we looking for two-word answer or either or? Uh, it's blank or blank, so it would be bullish or bearish is the right. answer. Gotcha. Okay, we got that now. All right, so Sal A, I need your username, please, and congrats on a hat. Nice work, Sal. And let's see, second person looks like, well, you've already won, uh, Drew, so we've got to go to the third person. Keeping it fair here. Okay, looks like Chris. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, C C B Ed Edisary. And I hope I get close on the names. Sorry, guys. So C B. I need your B M T username for the for the shirt. And let me write down Sal's. Hey Sal, I recognize that name. You won some prizes before. Good job. And I still need. Uh, CB's username. Hope I'm pronouncing that close enough to he knows I'm talking about him at least. Let's, 
Let's see. S E B Y. There we go. Okay. All right. So now, now we're going to the combines, right? Now we're doing combines. We got four combines. What the combine? Those that aren't familiar, the combine is how we evaluate traders in our program. It's going to help you do uh, one of two things. It's going to help you develop, or it's going to help you get discovered. Or it's going to do a combo of both. Uh, we like to keep traders out of the market with their own capital until they are ready to be in the market. So it's going to help you uh, get the confidence back. It's going to help you work on your strategy. Uh, what we do by doing that, we hold you accountable, and that's what the count, uh, combine does. It holds you accountable and also, also provides an opportunity for you. So <clears throat> that's one thing I'm going to provide here. Uh, so Big Mike, you tell me when you're ready. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm still waiting for his username, but I'll, I'll come back to it. So go ahead. Okay. okay. Which traditional pattern has a large real body bearish candle? followed by a bullish candle with a gap open lower than the bullish candle high that closes up at least 50% back into the first bar's real body. Wow. Okay. The answer is piercing pattern and we got it in here. That's a that's a uh, a person who pays attention right there. Right. That's a tough one. Uh now you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you decide, Mike. Because I see two different answers. One is kind of close, pretty close, and one is a perfect match. Which one do you want to give it to? Uh, let's go with uh, the first one. Yeah, how close? Okay. Is it? Yeah, how close is he's, it? He's, he, okay, he says piercing line. Is that close enough? Up to yeah, you. that's fine. All yeah. right, so Neil, Neil P. Congrats on the combine, and I need your username, please. We get where we get where your head's at. <laughs> yeah, I figured it was yeah. close enough. It's hard to type that fast. Yeah. All right. So number two combine. Okay. So again, same thing. Here we go. A bullish belt hold line is a long bullish candle that opens on its low and closes near its high without creating what? A large shadow is the answer. Okay. Guys, you're smart. A lot of you guys are smart. You understand? This one has to be long or large. That's a lot of people knowing this stuff. That's good. Yeah, this answer has to say long or large because it can have a shadow. It just can't be a long or a large shadow. Okay, it has yeah. to say large, uh, a large shadow. So, uh, Justin H. A long or large. Sorry, long or long large. Or large yeah. Right. So, Justin H. Your BMT username, please. Nice work, Justin. And I, I think you know I've learned uh, over the. I don't even know, 11 webinars, I guess, that we've done this month. Uh, these guys, what they've been doing, and I think it's totally fair, is they, they're taking notes, like a notepad as we go, mm -hmm. and then they cut and paste the answer, you know, to, to get that extra few milliseconds of speed. No, no problem. No <laughs> problem. Keep the notepad. Right, we're competing against the HFCs. Why not, why not use our little advantage, huh? Right. Keep the notepad and use it in your trading. Too. There you go. Keep the notepad and use it in your trading. Okay, combine number three. Okay. Which basic candlestick has a small real body, either bullish or bearish, with a long lower shadow that is two times the height of the real body and little or no shadow at the top? Hammer's the answer, and we got a lot of those out there. Yeah. Uh, Fawaz, I need your BMT username. Congrats on that. Got some and technicians out there. <laughs> Absolutely. That's crazy. Okay, so now uh, fourth and final combine, right? Here we go, guys. Which traditional pattern has a large real body bullish candle followed by an inside bar small bearish candle? It is okay, we've got The answer it. is bearish harami. Yep. John L. Need your BMT username. Congratulations. Okay, so uh, I'm going to get in touch with the uh, prize winners, the, it looks like, what, 12 winners. I'll contact you as soon as the webinar is done. Get the uh, info that we need to send over to uh, Top Step Trader and get those prizes in your hands. So I want to thank Mike and Bob, as always, for the time they put into the presentation and to uh, come and talk today and to answer everybody's questions and just remind everybody that if you have more questions, then uh, send them an email or visit their website. Yep.
Yeah, Big Mike, I want to thank you for having us on. Those guys that got the shirt and the hats will be expecting a thank you card for the, the games that you received. <laughs> and those that are in the combine will be seeing you in our program here very soon. Big Mike, thanks a lot for having us. Congratulations on your anniversary. You look much younger than four years. Uh, Big, Mike, you got, Big Mike, you got a great program. Everybody's paying attention. He, Big Mike is one of the uh, best guys to work with. He's got an incredible company going on and what he's doing. And uh, we truly like working with you every time we're on here with you. Appreciate it, guys. I'll see you back in a couple months. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye. See ya.